the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York is being investigated. I'm talking here, sir. I'm sorry. A dozen former Jehovah's Witnesses have infiltrated this Kingdom Hall. It's a few miles from the religious sect's world headquarters in New York State. Among them, Canadian Trisha Franginia from Edmonton. My father sexually abused me for the first 14 years of They say Jehovah's Witnesses' policies fail to protect child sex abuse victims, shield pedophiles, and shun people who speak out. And they want this congregation to hear what they have to say. I was raped and was told you shouldn't have done that, and I was disfellowshipped for it. 18 years old and not allowed to have my mother talk to me for a year. One after another, the protesters stand up to make disturbing allegations. Allegations that many of these congregants have likely never heard before. My ex-husband is a pedophile. Right he raped right two children in the We're King Hall. He is still allowed to be talked to by everybody. This is an organization that's supposed to love and protect children. Your invitation to be here has been revoked. Don't shun your children. JWFacts.com. After several minutes, everyone is finally ejected, and the chaos spills outside. But the accusations continue. Can I ask you how many pedophiles have you encountered in your in your record as an elder? I'm sorry, there's no comment. Yeah, you, know, you, you treat <laughs> yeah, us like we're course. dead. I will not hate you guys. I will not hate you. You look at me like oh, don't exist. I'm telling you, as a man, I'm I'm right here. So I have no more time in my life for you guys. I'm done with this whole thing, man. Done. A single police officer shows up, and the group slowly leaves. They reassemble in a parking lot across the street, happy they forced a different point of view into fresh ears. Trisha Franginia, who says she survived years of sexual abuse as a child, thinks the protesters' plan wasn't perfect, but it's still worth celebrating. You could tell that people were just like, oh God, like plugging their ears. But there were a couple in the front that seemed really affected by it. So you never know who's going to go home and, and try and find the truth. The police officer returns a few minutes later, and the group thinks that they're going to be told to leave. Obviously, it's private property, so you yeah. might have to leave, and you guys. But instead of asking them to clear out, he has something else on his mind. Holy Spirit, what's your view on that? It's an active force, just like we're breathing here. For the next 20 minutes, the group and the cop talk religion. I know the, uh, the Christian Church and the Jehovah's Witness obviously have some theological differences. The reception much friendlier than what they got at the Kingdom Hall. All right, well, uh, good luck up Thank there, you. and good luck to the Warwick police officers up there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Have a really good rest of the day. Have a great day. The group may be small and their tactics improvised, but what they're saying echoes a much larger movement that's being heard in courts and high levels of government around the world. In 2015, an Australian Royal Commission investigated how the Jehovah's Witnesses organization handles allegations of child sexual abuse and how often those allegations are reported to police. It's not done unless there's a legal requirement for it to be done, is there? I just check. After weeks of testimony from victims, elders, and experts, the commission concluded, we do not believe that children are adequately protected from the risk of sexual abuse. They went on to state, we do not consider the Jehovah's Witness organization to be an organization which responds adequately to child sexual abuse. In this exchange, senior counsel of the commission, Angus Stewart, refuses to let a Jehovah's Witness elder deflect blame. What ability have we got to protect every child in Australia? What you can do is you can report to uh, the child protection authorities. And that is done in some cases. But generally it's not done, is it? No. The commission also uncovered what had, up until that moment, been just a rumor that the Jehovah's Witnesses kept a secret database of every single known and suspected child abuser within their congregations. Not one was reported by the church to secular authorities. Since 1950, JW elders in Australia have documented potential child sexual abuse cases against 1,006 members. Not one of them ever reported to police. 
Half a world away, Jehovah's Witnesses are also coming under legal scrutiny in the United Kingdom. How difficult is it to litigate uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses? They're extremely difficult to litigate against. Kathleen Hallisey is a London-based lawyer who won the first ever judgment against the Jehovah's Witnesses in the UK for historic sexual abuse. Her office has become the go-to law firm for challenging the Jehovah's Witnesses. Do you believe that the Jehovah's Witnesses have a policy that purposefully protects pedophiles and, and puts children at risk? I do. I would describe it as a scandal and a global cover-up and a protection of abusers. At the risk of children? Absolutely. Hallisey says a British public inquiry is looking into how institutions have failed to protect children from sexual abuse, and there's now public pressure to open a separate investigation that focuses solely on Jehovah's Witnesses. If you have a policy that requires there to be a second witness to child abuse, it means that virtually every allegation of child abuse is going to go no further. And that puts the child at risk, it puts other children at risk, and it protects the person who's the abuser. And now Canada has joined the fray. Two class action lawsuits have been filed against the Jehovah's Witnesses, officially known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. The courts haven't yet certified either lawsuit, which accused the organization of failing to protect children from sexual abuse. It is a captive organization, so that means you can never leave. Christian Gutierrez was one of those children. He's the public face of one of the lawsuits, a suit that seeks $66 million and will represent dozens of alleged victims. I like this one. Christian and his yeah. wife Katya live here in Calgary. Christmas ended months ago but their apartment is still peppered with decorations and even a tree. We are obsessed with Christmas because we've only celebrated Christmas four times. We weren't allowed as Jehovah's Witnesses, so it's really special and we try to keep it up as long as possible. Four years ago, both were disfellowshipped, cut out and shunned because they started questioning the authority of the leaders. But it took years of fear and abuse to get there, starting when Christian was just a child. I remember I used to be a, a child that liked to dance a lot and as I was um, getting older, um, that started to stop. I remember coming to sit on the couch with my father and he would have the book on one side and he would have the belt on the other side ready if I didn't summarize what I had read properly, I would get a spanking. And Eatings. Yeah. The strict corporal punishment was nothing compared to what happened to Christian when he was just five. I was um, hurt as a child um, by this man. It was very upsetting because uh, to this day, certain smells can make me remember it. Um, if I hear someone buckling their belt, you know, it brings me back to the memories of it. The past is still too painful to relive in detail, but Christian says he was sexually abused by a man in his congregation. When my father found out, I got in very big trouble. And that is one of the most crushing moments because what you need is you need help and you need support. And what I got from him was, why did you go to the elders? Does anyone say to you, oh, Christian, we need to go to the police. Who, who is this? Are you okay? It was never brought up to go to the police, not once. Instead of calling the police, Christian says elders told him he could heal himself by reading. They gave me magazines of their own literature on sexual abuse and that these magazines were going to help me to get better. They were going to make me feel better um, from what I went through. Whatever happened to the, to the man who sexually abused you? To my knowledge, nothing has happened. Is he still in the, in the organization? I believe so. Katya knows her husband's pain. She knows what it's like to grow up as a Jehovah's Witness with a dark secret. 
parts of your childhood are in here. Is mm -hmm. it weird to look through these photographs? It is because like it's my childhood and you want to look at them and be happy, but it just reminds you, like it reminds me of all the bad times. Even back then, Katya couldn't hide her misery, not even from the camera. In my eyes, you can just see. Sadness. It's just, yeah, it's just sadness. Sunglasses could shield red puffy eyes, but they couldn't hide the haunted face of a victim. And it's kind of PTSD looking at a picture of me at that age in a bathtub, because that's the time I had certain abuse happen to me was in a bathtub. Do you want to share with us what happened to you, Katya? Yeah, I was sexually abused by a close family relative of mine. And this person was also an elder and also a Jehovah's Witness. I don't feel like going into exact detail of what took place, but um, I was, you know, sexually touched. I was just very stressed and scared, and I had a lot of anxiety. So much anxiety that at the age of just 10, Katya took a kitchen knife into her room and held it to her wrist. I feel like I was going through all this and nobody noticed. And I, I, I just, I was looking for someone to, to help me. And I thought maybe in a child's mind, maybe if I tried to take my life, it would get someone to, to notice that I, I need help. Before Katya could hurt herself, her mother found her with that knife and rushed her to the hospital. So you get to the hospital, and what did the doctors at the hospital say to you? Um, they did a lot of questioning just on my history, what my family life was like. They asked me, is there anything else that you want to share, anything else that's causing you to feel scared at home or anything or in your life? And that's when I, I said, yeah, there's something else that I want to say. And I told them that I was being sexually abused at the same time. You told the doctors? Yeah. And it was one of those doctors who called the police. Shortly after, a close family member of Katya's was charged with sexual assault and sexual interference. But things did not get easier. After speaking to police, Katya was summoned to talk to the elders, a 10-year-old girl in a room full of men. What did they specifically ask you about the sexual abuse? I remember the elders actually asked me, do you know if there's two other witnesses involved to this? And I said, no. And they said, well, nothing we can do, leave it in Jehovah's hands. They didn't even say we're sorry to hear what happened to you or anything. Katya says one elder took it even farther. And he said, if you really were sexually abused, that you would have squealed like a pig, which you did not, which means it never happened. And he told me that I'm a liar and that I need to clear this person's name and tell the police what I said was not true. Katya refused, but it didn't matter. Before the trial, her alleged abuser fled to Europe, where he lives to this day and is the father of two young girls. You both feel in your experience that this organization protected the pedophile at the detriment of the child of you both. Oh yeah, for sure. It really does destroy your soul. It's, it's almost like, in my opinion, it is murder because you kill the person inside. Hiding the crimes. The written policy was we keep known child molesters secret. While victims suffer. My innocence was taken away. When W5 continues.